Ah, I'm in my kitchen that I've wrought with my own two hands, just like Jansen, except I don't have the leather jacket because I literally, I lost it in the move. I don't know where it's at. We're here today to take a look at the RTX 3090 for machine learning. Now, when the RTX 3090 launched a couple of months ago, tons of places were super eager to rush out the machine learning benchmarks and all that stuff. Well, bad news. Uh, that, rush, that launch was rushed. There was a lot of rush and consternation and uh, yeah, it was not, not, not a great situation as far as drivers goes. In fact, I think everybody that did an early review of the RTX 3090 for machine learning said, eh, there's room for improvement here. I've got a Tesla V100, which is not a lot, a thing not a lot of other people can say, and we've done a lot with it, but I'm curious how the RTX 3090 stacks up for machine learning on Linux. We're gonna take a look. Mmm, fresh out of the oven, the RTX 3090. But not even this RTX 3090, this is the Founders Edition version of the 3090. We're gonna use the MSI Supreme X version of the 3090 because it's got a little bit of an overclock, a little bit more oomph. Yeah, we'll compare it with the Founders Edition 3090 so you know what you're getting into, but let's take a look. Off to the lab. Shh, bad kitty, bad kitty. Alright, so I've got a terminal here. We're using we're using the Buntu because it's it, you know it's easy. You'd be surprised how many machine learning research scientists that are otherwise brilliant people in their field are just like yeah yeah I don't care just fix it I don't care. It's like I want to focus on you know whatever tiny tiny area it is of their research. They don't want to think about integration or machine learning or anything. So fast forward here. What we're looking at is ResNet 50, which is, you know, I mean, it's it's a pretty, I mean, it's an interesting problem set. It has to do with image recognition and training. It's come to be accepted as a TensorFlow benchmark, but there are other good TensorFlow benchmarks, things like Inception V3 and V4, uh, other variations of ResNet like 128 uh, or 152. Um, but ResNet 50, you've got a lot of data from other sites and it's pretty easy to get that up and running. Now, if you are using the 3090 uh, in a Linux box, I would recommend that you add it as like a secondary GPU. If you're using a server chassis, which I don't really recommend, and we'll talk more about that later, um, it'll have onboard VGA and so it's not really much of an issue. But if you just set up a, you know, a Linux workstation, a Threadripper workstation, whatever, um, try to use something else as your GPU. Strictly speaking, it's not absolutely necessary. Historically it was, but um, strictly speaking, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's nice to be able to have a dedicated GPU or two uh, just for your machine learning benchmarks. Now, our results. ResNet 50, floating point 16 and floating point 32. That's where the magic happens. Although the 3090s add support for int eight. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's just, 8-bit integers, like that's that's a thing that you could do. Uh, there's also double precision, which is supported better on the A100s than the 3090. So it's really not the complete feature set that you would expect for full machine learning on the 3090, but you do have 24 gigs of VRAM, and that's really the one choice over like the 3080, because if you look at the 3080 and the 3090, their performance is gonna be almost identical, assuming that your problem set fits in 10 gigs of VRAM. And you will out of memory pretty easily on TensorFlow, so 24 gigs of VRAM, that kind of thing. That said, it's not really exactly the same as the Titan. You know, everybody talks about the driver path on the Titan, but in order to make that more clear, we've got our trusty old Tesla V100. So we've done a ton of videos with the Tesla V100 on level one. It's mostly, you know, the more esoteric stuff that falls by the wayside a little bit, but we've got some, you know, rabid uh, ardent supporters that are like, yeah, more machine learning stuff, benchmarks, woo. Uh, research scientists, stuff like that in the audience. So this GPU is implemented with HBM. This, this GPU is basically the same silicons, almost the same printed circuit board, almost the same setup as the Titan, uh, the, the Volta version of the Titan. Uh, it's just that the Tesla V100 doesn't have uh, soldered connectors. When you're doing things like VFIO and virtualization, it is entirely possible to pass the Tesla V100 through as a Titan and use Titan drivers in a virtual machine and then use looking glass to attach to the, you know, the display. 
uh, you wouldn't really want to because a Titan costs less than a V100, but this has 32 gigs of VRAM, whereas the you know Titan only has 24 gigs of VRAM. Um, there's also a version of this that has 16 gigs of VRAM, but that's the 32 gig version. So it's the same. All right. Well, the 3090 was touted as the Titan replacement, except for the professional driver path is gimped, so the performance is not as good as it could be. It's literally just a software limitation, not a limitation on the hardware. But the problem is that the difference between the 3090 and the A100 is substantial. The A100 is even a different lithography. It's HBM. Uh, it's produced on a TSMC lithography process. It is not uh, the Samsung process that the 3090 uses. So there probably is some Titan-esque thing coming from NVIDIA, I would say. Or, or maybe not. I don't know. Uh, the clock speed is quite a bit higher, and the power requirements are quite a bit higher of the 3090, which are, the power requirements make it another thing that's, make it not suitable for servers, because there is a, uh, an optimization curve in the data center where it just uses too much power for the amount of real estate that it takes up inside the data center. The data center would just rather buy more that use less power um, overall than have something that uses twice as much power for only a 10% performance benefit. Because if you have two cards, theoretically, depending on what your workload is, that's gonna be a, a near doubling um, for the things you're doing in the data center. So the other thing is that the launch day drivers, so TensorFlow 2.3, you know, floating point 16 and floating point 32. I'm being long-winded here. You probably already skipped to the level one article. I just want to explain because there's a lot of nuance and subtlety here that are lost in a lot of other reviews. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to come at you with, you know, 800 pounds of numbers. You can get that elsewhere on the internet. But why 800 pounds of numbers elsewhere? You should have a little bit of skepticism. So floating point 16 with a batch size of 512 out of the box performance. It's about 971 images per second, and that's pretty consistent with what has been reported elsewhere. The problem is that when I look at this, I can tell that it's not performing like it should. Uh, I conferred with a colleague, Mark M, and uh, thanks for the help on this, by the way. And he's like, yeah, no, you can, you can get more out of it than that. You just need a little bit more optimization, a little bit more fine tuning. So we do a little bit more fine tuning or floating point 16. We'll come back to floating point 32. And again, still with a batch size of 512, still on ResNet 50, we can get it up to about 1400 images per second. That's 50% better, and that's about where it should be. And that's about twice as fast as our Tesla V100. That's within spitting distance of the A100. But the thing to keep in mind is the A100 has HBM memory. It has more HBM memory, 40 or 80 gigabytes. Um, so anything that's memory intensive is going to be a lot faster. It uses less power, and it is clocked at a lower speed. So the, what the 3090 doesn't have in compute units that the A100 has, the 3090 makes up for it a little bit by drinking the power, just guzzling it like it's no, you know, it guzzles power like a 1978, you know, Chrysler LeBaron gu guzzles gasoline or something. I don't know. Now floating point 32, you know, you move up these, these cards are, uh, I don't want to say intentionally gimped, but floating point 32, it's, NVIDIA is very careful to try to maintain some of their market segmentation. So the performance is a little less than half best case scenario. You're looking at about 600 to 700 images per second with optimization on the MSI Supreme X. And keep in mind that card has a little bit of an overclock. It's a triple slot GPU. Another nuance that I'll mention when you're doing this kind of benchmarking is XLA. So the people at Google and working on TensorFlow looked at this and they said, hey, you know, there are some operations here that are just linear algebra operations. There's some low hanging fruit here for optimizations to do with linear algebra. Enter XLA. Now out of the box, the performance here with XLA is not going to make that much of a difference, but depending on what your data set is and what you're benchmarking, like if you're benchmarking like Inception V3, V4, it can make a difference. So that's another nuance that you sort of have to worry about. If you have real world problems that you're doing stuff with TensorFlow, I would, I would love to hear from you on the level one forum, just so I can use it as examples in future videos and understand a little bit more about it. Um, you know, getting started with CUDA and using NVIDIA's compute resources for machine learning, even outside of TensorFlow, NVIDIA really has gone out of their way to make it as easy as possible to use their products. Of course, that makes sense. They're going to sell more products because you get, you know, it, 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 this kind of a negative connotation, but you get locked in to using those tools and that stuff and all of the, all of the free Kool-Aid. But, you know, again, if you're a research scientist and you don't care, 
then you just plug it in, it works. And I can see the appeal of that. It's certainly very attractive when I'm doing benchmarks and things like that. The other thing that I wanna mention really quick is Docker. So the full guide in the level one forums talks about this a little bit more, but the idea with Docker is to make things even easier on research scientists at a cost of maybe not having quite as good optimization. So if you install the community edition version of Docker, which is gonna be, you know, copy paste commands into the command line because the version of Docker that's, you can get uh, from Ubuntu without doing, you know, without jumping through hoops is not the right version of Docker. You want the community edition of Docker. Uh, the TensorFlow 2.3 Docker container right now affords the best performance that I've been able to find. Um, that I'm not 100% sure that that's universally true. So if you have experience with that, let me know in the level one forum or or what your experiences are. But uh, Docker, you know, it's a contain containerization technology. So with just a few lines of code, you can install Docker CE on your workstation or on your server, and then you can get a TensorFlow container. And it already has Python if you want, and some other options depending on which one you get. There's a, there's a, there's a whole library of Docker containers. But the one that we're interested in specifically uh, is the Bleeding Edge one that includes TensorFlow uh, 2.3. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that I'm talking about, but for these benchmarks, that's what uh, I was able to use uh, to reproduce some of these results. So uh, it's a little convoluted. There's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross, but machine learning benchmarking um, <laughs> is, is is both easier than ever and more complicated than ever because of all of the different things that are available with machine learning. So be sure to check out the uh, the how to the guide on the level one forum if you're if you're getting into that. But this was as, as quick a look as I could do with ResNet 50 and to explain how things are different because it's like 3090 is the Titan replacement. No, no, that's not not just for driver reasons but also physical card architecture. There's not a lesser expensive enthusiast version of the A100. You know, Nvidia's Nvidia's got me stuck paying for graphics cards at the high end because you know, running testing and gotta build that AI hotel from Altered Carbon and, uh, you know, you gotta put the AI to work for you. It can't be working in the cloud because you're never sure it's actually working for you. Looking at those performance numbers and the options, what are the gotchas? Well, remember that Gigabyte GPU server that we've got? You should definitely check out the coverage on that. That thing is a monster. The problem is that these RTX 3090s, none of them are designed for use in a server chassis. Generally server chassis, and especially that one, are designed for passive cooling. Look at our Tesla V100. There's no fan, it's a pure pass-through design. It's designed for that server chassis and that server hardware. There's also a licensing consideration. Yeah, Nvidia doesn't want you to use these gaming graphics cards in the data center. It says that in the license agreement. So if you find yourself wanting to scale up, you're gonna need to buy more expensive GPUs, things like the A100, GPUs for machine learning or whatever it is that you might be doing that requires a lot of GPU compute or GPU horsepower. Now there's there's some nuance and some subtlety there that I don't really want to get into in this video, but just bear in mind that things will get kind of tricky. There are also other versions of the RTX 3090. If you're going to pack in multiple RTX 3090 GPUs in a single chassis, believe it or not, that blower style, that's a pretty good choice for um, that kind of a configuration. I mean, you can get, you know, 3090s that have a built-in uh, water block and use, you know, custom loop cooling. That's certainly an option, but that's more expensive. But I still think that machine learning factoring in to a lot of future careers and a lot of things historically that maybe computers weren't a super interesting part of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. So no matter what kind of a GPU you have, chances are you can do some kind of machine learning. And machine learning applied to uh, lots of other interesting industries is sort of a thing. Like there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. So if you learn a little bit about programming and machine learning, you've got a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it's basically the wild west, you know, stake a claim, build something with machine learning. You don't need an RTX 3090 GPU to do that, but it's, uh, it's a pretty good middle tier stepping stone once you've kind of figured out the business model, once you've kind of figured out the math and you've figured out uh, you know, what interesting things are gonna happen. I've seen, you know, personally, a lot of really uh, incredible things from applying machine learning to previously intractable physics problems. 
things like, oh, let's use math to compute the shape of this molecule. I mean, theoretically, that's always been possible, but the math is like super pain in the butt. Well, the research is like, hey, let's take physical models that we know and the math that we know and throw them into an AI and see if it can make some predictions. And it is. So machine learning is literally everywhere and it's going to take over the universe even more than it already has. Not, you know, toward sentience or toward robot butlers, but toward quietly optimizing and figuring out everything that so far we as human beings have not been able to figure out. And then we have to figure out what the machine figured out, which is a whole other process in and of itself. So machine learning is really super exciting. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. I'm gonna go hang out in the Level One forums. Check out all your cool machine learning projects because we just had Devember and there's a lot of really cool interesting stuff there. So I'm signing out and I'll see you there. Look, I'm not flexing on Jensen or anything. I'm just saying this is a lot easier to clean. Yeah, we'll compare with the Founders Edition as well so you know what you're getting into. But 